Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Happy Father's Day. Thanks for being here with us today. I want to wish all the fathers a happy, happy Father's Day. If uh, before you leave, if you want to have your picture taken, you can do it with uh, your spouse if you'd like, or you can just do it. Whatever your choice. If we're set up right through that door, so you can, after services, you can have your picture taken. Sorry, I was late and I ran up here. Kind of like last night when I did my meditation, I and I was out of out of breath. So I just want you to know, anyone who wants a yard sale spot for next Saturday, John needs to know today, okay, to reserve a spot. Oh, it's July. 15th. I didn't get the, yeah, so July 15th is the yard sale, but John needs to know if you want a spot today, okay? Thanks to everybody that helped with praise and worship last night. It was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, burgers. And Thanks for being there, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll do it again next year, hopefully. Continue to be in prayer for our worship leader. Uh, be, for, be, be in prayer for Daniel and Rachel. End of the month, they've done such a wonderful job, and we've loved having them here with Banks. And we're going to miss them a lot. So give them your love. You got until next Sunday? You got until next Sunday to tell them how much you love them. So do that, please. You can tell them after that. They'll take love anytime. Remember our mission of the month, which is the jail ministry. Continue to be in prayer for the inmates and their families and for the officers that work there and their families too. And also, uh, always, Brian, Brad, and Laura, uh, they go into the jail uh, and represent Jesus Christ to the, uh, to the prisoners there. So be, with, be in prayer. Remember our item of the month for JAMA uh, is pancake service. We, uh, we served 40 families last Thursday and we had a lot of fun doing it. If you can pick up a bottle or two of uh, uh, syrup and put them in the, the, the containers back in the side door there. Uh, this Tuesday at 4.30 is our elders meeting. Uh, everyone is... Uh, an open meeting so um, we're going to do it here at the church at the, in the fellowship hall and that's all I have are there any other announcements that I missed today welcome back Mary Lou today your anniversary it is well, today is <coughs> my uh, Susan and my anniversary uh, <laughs> Will you pray with me and we'll get our uh, service started. Father God, we thank you so much for loving us. We thank you for forgiving us. We thank you for uh, accepting us as your children, Lord. God, we love you and we give you all the praise and all the glory for all that you do in our lives. And Lord, I just, I pray that you would uh, bless our worship. to remember you and everything that we say and do and God be with Rachel and Daniel as they as they lead us and, and God I pray that we would just bring uh, wonderful happy praiseful voices to you and that we would lift up uh, our songs and praise and God be with Bob as he uh, gives us a
pray that you would just uh, speak through him and, and Holy Spirit just touch his heart, touch his, uh, his voice and, and his body that uh, they would have a lot of breath and, and God, help us to open our minds to uh, what you have to share with us today, Lord. God, be with us as we, uh, as we pray for one another and as we, uh, as we do the Lord's. Uh, God, we just thank you so much for all that you do. Just bless our time together, we pray today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's sing. Open up the head.
Yeah. 
Thank you so much for this morning. We, we rejoice in your victory this morning. We just praise you. And, uh, God, I pray you'll be with Bob as he preaches your word. And I pray you'll be with all of us as we continue to worship and praise your name. And just pray that all the glory will go to you. I pray this in your name. Amen. Before we let the children go out, let me just remind us that today is Father's Day. And I wish all of you men a Father's Day, a happy Father's Day, whether you're a dad or not. To somebody, you're important. Somebody looks up to you. Somebody cares that you exist on this planet. Not that long ago about Mother's Day and talked about how it came to be, but while Father's Day was originally celebrated on June 19th of 1910, it wasn't until 1972 that Father's Day was recognized as a national day of observance, some 58 years after Mother's Day was made a this nation. We may laugh at that and wonder why did it take so long and if you read much about Father's Day and how it ever came to be, 
a lot of people suggest that Father's Day took so long to get started because dads didn't want people celebrating them and buying them gifts that ultimately they probably had to pay for anyway. <laughs> Father's Day to everyone. We're glad you're here this morning, and now you may be released to Children's Church. Yay yeah. yeah. yeah, is right. You know, the older I get, the more I re be re am reminded of special days. And I don't know why that is, but it just seems like Christmas takes on a new meaning, Thanksgiving takes on new meanings. Maybe it's because I've got children of my own. grandchildren of my own, and it, those days just mean more, partly because there's more people to celebrate them with. Maybe that's what it is. And One of the things Debbie and I really miss about being here instead of Arizona is our home was always the home where all the family gathered. Christmas Day, there would be 40 people in our house celebrating Christmas. We'd be there from sun up to sundown just celebrating Thanksgiving was almost always the same way that on Thanksgiving everybody would come to our house and we'd have food out the yin yang as they say and we would eat from the time everybody started showing up. In fact, those of us who like to cook know you start eating while you're cooking because you're sampling and then by the time it's time to eat you're so full that you just really have to force yourself to keep eating and then when everybody gets ready to go home everybody's filling up baskets with food and and well, you got a sample to make sure it's still good. It hasn't spoiled, sitting out on the cabinet or anything. And there's always one last piece of dessert before you go to bed at night, right? But special days, just for me at least, become more precious as the years go by. Maybe it's because I realize I don't have as many of them left like I did 50 years ago. Whatever it is, I hope you enjoy special days too. Question for you as we move into our lesson this morning. If you saw yourself as a citizen of the kingdom of God, how might that change the way you act? Most of us, I suspect, and I include myself in this, can go all day without really thinking much about, I'm a child of God, I'm a citizen in his kingdom, and I need to act that way. If you're like me, you get up in the morning, your life gets busy, and before you know it, the day is gone, and you haven't spent a whole lot of time thinking about, God is my Father. Christ is my brother. God's Holy Spirit lives in me, and I'm a citizen of his kingdom, and how am I reflecting his lordship in the life that I live? We're in the midst of a study of the book of Philippians. This is a book that we've mentioned already that has so much practical application to every one of us who are children of God. Paul's in prison, but he's writing a book that's full of joy, full of optimism, expecting us, no matter what our circumstances, to live in a way that gives glory to God. John asked you last week, and thank you for your prayers. I know I didn't get word out, but I know some of you found out about how I was feeling last week, and I appreciate you thinking about me. But John asked last week here in his lesson, how many of us are reading the book of Philippians? How many of us are staying ahead so that by the time we get up here and bring a message to you, you already know what the book says. You're already reading it to see how does it apply to me, and then you're listening to see did Bob or John or whoever else preaches during this series, did they get the same thing from the book that I got from the book? Or, or did they add something to it? 
One of the problems with God's children, we don't study the book enough. We don't read the Bible enough. We're not doing our best to learn what's in here. And many of you, I'm sad to say, will not pay attention to what the Bible says until next Sunday. You won't pick it up during the week. You won't think about it very often. You'll just move on through your life as though it's not all that important. And then you'll show up next week, and once again, some preacher will be saying, you need to read the book. And you'll be saying, will you just lighten up on reading the book? How many times do I need to hear that? You know, sometimes we're just not going to change, are we? If the only Bible you're getting is the Bible that you get for 30 or 40 minutes here on Sunday morning, you're starving to death. You're never going to reflect the glory of God the way he wants you to because you're missing out on the messages he wants to share with you. And you're thinking, well, so what? I'm a Christian already. Let me tell you, so what? <coughs> Dear friend of ours, Stephanie Menina, who we consider family, <coughs> sent a text out yesterday. Debbie read it to me. They just spent the week over in Hilton Head, and they're on their way back to California. I'm, of course, thinking, don't they have beaches in California? You fly all the way from California to go to it. But anyway, they had a family reunion over there. She says they were flying back home, and they got to Chicago to change planes. And they were, she was there either standing in line or doing something, and she says she's listening to two young, either teenager or early 20-year-old girls. One of them turns to the other and says, we're going to be in a lot of different states today. They must have been flying a long way as well. What state are we in now? And the other girl said, Chicago. <laughs> Oh, wow. And Stephanie, bless her heart, said to them, Chicago's not a state. Chicago is a city in the state of Illinois. She said, one of those little girls, I left my phone down there, I pulled my phone up, pulled her phone out and said, Siri, is Chicago a state? <laughs> and Stephanie's last comment was, we're not going to make it, are we? I say that to say this. While we may laugh at the lack of education it seems like our children are getting today, especially geography and things that you and I took for granted and had to memorize and had to write down on paper and had to make sure we knew all the states and their capitals and all this other stuff, what their nickname was and, and all that. And today it just seems like people don't learn that very much. But even as we laugh at them and think, <laughs> how silly. If we're not careful, we treat this book the same way. We're as ignorant of what it says and what God wants from us as those people are and which state are they in, thinking they're in the state of Chicago. We need to be reading the Word of God. Central Christian Church offers a lot of Bible studies. We have a lot of opportunities for you to come and join us in Bible studies, and we're covering things from Old Testament prophecies to the book of 2 Corinthians and, and almost everything in between. If you want to be in a Bible study, ask me, ask John, ask one of the elders, ask almost anybody in here. They'll tell you when the Bible studies are. We would love to have you in them so that you can share your wisdom and knowledge with the rest of us. And so that all of us can be learning together. This morning we're going to finish up chapter 1 of Philippians. I always struggle going through a book piece by piece because the book has so much in it. And so many times this first part of the chapter applies to chapter 3 and chapter 2 reverts back to some other one. And it's tough to do it this way, but sometimes there's not a better way to do it. As we go through this little book, I'm hoping we're learning this is a book where God comes through the letter of Paul to remind us how we're supposed to live in God's church. Here's how this chapter ends, verses 27 through 30 of chapter 1. He says, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. 
This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. I don't know about you, but one of the struggles I have trying to live a Christian life is my desire to respond to things that irritate me, that make me look at things that just drive me bananas, and I want to respond in a way that I know Christ would not want me to respond, but sometimes it's just impossible not to. Sometimes it's very difficult not to see what's going on in the world around us, what's going on in churches around us, what purported Christians claim and teach and do, and not get frustrated. Because we react to things, sometimes without paying much attention to what we're doing. And we don't pay attention then to, what kind of an example am I being? How are people seeing Christ in me if I'm acting the same way people who don't know Jesus Christ act? And so how am I living in such a way that God gets the glory instead of people wondering, I thought you went to church. I thought you were a Christian. Or they'd go off walking and talking to each other and maybe say nothing ever to you or to me, saying to others, Oh, well, if that's what Christianity is, if that's what they are, they're acting like Bob does, well, why do I need that? I'm doing okay without having to get up and come to church on Sunday. I can do okay just like he does, claiming to be a Christian. I can do whatever I want. So the challenge to us and the challenge Paul makes to the church in Philippi here at the end of this chapter as we've broken the book apart is we need to live in a way that shows people that we belong to Jesus. We need to act in such a way that when people see us, they see Christ in us. They don't see Bob in me. They don't see me acting the way Bob wants to act. They see me acting the way Jesus would have me act. And if I will do that, then people will see that there's a value to being a child of God. There's a worth in living the way God wants you to live. And some of them will want it. All of us know there's not a person in this world that doesn't want a better life than the one they have. I don't care how great your life is. You can always look at something in your life and wish something was different. Maybe it's a health issue. Many of us in this room this morning struggle with some health issues or some aches and pains. And we can look at our lives and think, you know, life would be awesome if I didn't have this bum ankle that I have to put this brace on every day when I get up. You know, one of the problems with this brace, I can't wear sandals. Because Debbie and I were seeing this the other day. We were walking somewhere. I don't remember now where we were, but the Sam's Club, maybe. Some old guy, probably my age. <laughs> shorts halfway up his thighs with black shoes and black socks. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but we've laughed at that our whole life. I mean, you don't wear. And please, if you do that, I'm not talking about you. If that's the way you like to dress, if that's your fashion style, knock yourself out. But Debbie and I have always looked at people who wear these real nice shorts, and then they've got their black shoes and black socks on. I miss wearing sandals. I've got some really cool sandals, but because of this brace I wear, which is this nice black dark color, Partly it won't fit in some of my sandals, but even if I wore my sandals, I'd look like one of those old guys with shorts and black socks and shoes. So I don't wear shorts much anymore. But we look at stuff like that and we see people, and, and if we're not careful, the world looks at us as Christians and they make fun of us. And we're as funny to them as a guy wearing clothes that makes you laugh when you see the guy wearing them. And they look at us and they cannot imagine why we act the way we do, why we teach the way we do, why we try to live the way we do, when all they want to do is just get by. You and I have something to offer. It may not be our fashion sense, but it's Jesus. 
You and I have the opportunity to show people in this world that there's some better way to live than what they're struggling through. And sadly, sometimes we don't make it work. John quoted a passage last week that I'm going to use again today because I think it's important for us, especially as we go through the book of Philippians, because Paul makes it clear that God's people get along with each other. God's people work together. God's people make up a team that's sole purpose is to accomplish what God wants. And Jesus prayed in John chapter 17 as he's praying to his father, I give them the glory that you gave me. Jesus is talking about those 12 disciples, actually 11 by then, but he's also praying about us. We have glory in our Sunday morning Bible class that Bob Gibson's teaching. We're doing 2 Corinthians. And in chapter 3 today, we talked about as children of God, we have an ever increasing glory that shines through us, that people can see in us. And Paul uses the example of Moses when he came down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments. His face was shining and the people were afraid because they could see the glory of God shining in the face of Moses. And Paul goes on to say Moses had to put on a veil so that the people would approach him. But Paul says we as children of God don't have to wear a veil. The glory of God should be reflected in us. People should see God's glory reflected in us and be able to see that we are children of God. But Jesus says, I've given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I and them, you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Why? He says, then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you loved me. Jesus says, one of the ways the world will know that Jesus Christ came from the Father is if his people get along with each other. If his people work in unity. If they're hand in glove together, working toward a common goal, pulling together, doing things that cause God's church to be glorified. When we don't act in unity, the world gets to point its fingers at us and say, ha, what good is it to be a child of God you Sunday morning people can't even get along with each other. There is nothing I think that God despises more than his people who won't get along with each other. Who won't sit on the same side of the building. Who won't go to the same house. Who won't cooperate in getting things done because somebody's feelings was hurt, because somebody didn't get what they want, because somebody doesn't like what somebody else is doing. I don't like the temperature in here. It's cold. It's too hot. It's too mundane. And I don't even have a pew on my or a bench with padded back on it. It hurts my back. I don't like it. You know, we whine about everything. And I have no doubt God's sitting up there on his throne thinking, my son died for this. I gave you my son and you don't even like the person sitting next to you. You can't even get along with the people that sit in the same building as you. What's wrong with you? Jesus says that's how we know if we're children of God. That's how the world knows that Jesus Christ came from the Father. So Paul says this as he starts out this section. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of of the gospel of Christ. And I don't have to tell you, but I'm going to anyway, that's sometimes difficult to do, isn't it? You can look at your own life and say, I don't do that well. There are times when my conduct doesn't reflect the glory of God, isn't worthy of the price that was paid for my salvation. There are times we believe treating others kindly is just a waste of time. There are times when we think, I'm just never going to forgive that person for what they've done to me. Because we don't remember Christ has forgiven me 
everything I've ever done. And if you're a child of God, God has forgiven you for everything you've ever done. And we'll treat each other like we're cursed or something. Like we've got some horrible disease. And we'll avoid each other because we simply can't get along with each other. There are times we simply don't believe people deserve to be treated well. You know, you treated me so badly that I don't want anything to do with you. God says, you can't love the father who you haven't seen if you can't love your brother who you have seen. Now, I don't know about you, but if John, when he writes that in the book of 1 John, meant what he said, then there are a bunch of so-called Christian people claiming to love God who don't. Because they're not loving their brothers and sisters. Because we're not resolving issues. And yet we're praising God and singing all these beautiful songs. And John says, you're wasting your breath. Because you can't love God who you haven't seen if you can't love your brothers and sisters who you have seen. We need to work more on that. Paul says we need to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. The truth of the matter is, that is a poor translation. And I'm not a Greek scholar, but I read a lot. And if you read most of your translations, almost all of them read something like this. I think the King James says something like, let your conversation be such that it reflects the glory of God. Here in the NIV it says, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy. In reality, none of those translations are any good. What Paul is really saying and what the Greek word that's translated conduct yourself really means is, act like a citizen of the kingdom you belong to. Live as though you're proud of the citizen of the country that you were in. And when Paul writes to the Philippians, they understood what Paul meant by that because they were a Roman city established by Rome to be an outpost for the Roman Empire. And they understood exactly what it meant to be good citizens of Rome. And Paul says, if you're going to be a child of God, we need to behave worthy of citizenship. We're in the kingdom of God, and we should be proud of that, and we should make the kingdom proud of who we are by living the way God wants us to live. And Paul will go on in chapter 3 and explain what kingdom that is when he says in verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you are eagerly awaiting the return of Jesus? We should be. All of us are sort of caught up, and Paul did, said this earlier in this chapter, I'm torn between to live as Christ but to die as gain. And Paul says, I'm really struggling with, do I want to die and go with Jesus? Do I want these people who are persecuting me to just go ahead and get it over with? Go ahead and execute me so I can go to my father. Or do I want to stay here on this earth and be the Christ example that you need me to be so I can teach people about Jesus? And I suspect most of us understand that. Not to brag. The little Brooklyn one, the little Miss Cinderella Queen last weekend. She's the queen of the entire state of Tennessee for her age group. Yeah, no, I didn't do that to get applause. It's okay if you want to, because I love my grandkids. They are just special little girls. And she had worked her little fanny off and practiced and did all kinds of things to get to where she wanted to be. But now her job is to represent the organization of Cinderella for the next year. It didn't just win the prize and then go back to playing volleyball or whatever else she's going to be doing and forget the fact that you're now the queen of Cinderella for the state of Tennessee for a year. 
you've now got to represent the organization at different pageants, different groups, different parades, different events. They expect her to put on her cute little clothes and her crown and her gown and all this other stuff and go to these events and act the way Cinderella queens are supposed to act. She understands that. Do we? That when we become children of God, there is an expectation of us. And that is to live the way God expects us to. To be ambassadors for God's kingdom so that people can see Jesus living in us. So many times I think we forget that. And we think, well, I've won the prize. I'm saved. That's it. I think I'll just take a seat over here and just twiddle my thumbs for the next 40, 50, 60 years. Look how God doesn't expect anything from me. Yes, he does. He expects us to be his representatives. He expects us to be his ambassador. He expects us to go about our daily life letting people see what we won. Life through Jesus Christ. The forgiveness of sin. The ability to have God's Holy Spirit live in us. And we sometimes live our lives as though that's no big deal. Should be the biggest deal on the face of this earth. It should be the thing that controls our actions from the time we wake up to the time we go to bed. Being a child of God is not something we just do on Sunday morning. It's something we do every day, every hour. And God help us every minute if we could. But we get caught up in the idea that we've got this kingdom over here of heaven, and now I've got this kingdom over here which is earth. I've got a job. I've got a family. I've got kids. I've got a house to take care of. I've got a lawn to work in. And I'm eating up my poison ivy, by the way. Because my lawn loves poison ivy. And it does not love me. And so when I get out and work in my yard, as hard as I try to be careful, poison ivy grabs me almost every time I'm out there doing something. Sadly, that's the way the world works. I can be in God's garden. You know, there are so many neat church songs about the garden. And we can act like we're in the garden with Jesus and, and we're there with him and we're just enjoying the blissfulness. And as we get caught up in doing that and we get out in this world, there is poison ivy waiting to grab us. You can be as careful as you want to be. You can be as cautious as you can, but every once in a while, no matter what you do, that poison ivy is going to rub up against you and you're going to have rash all over you wherever that poison ivy shows up. And we have the same problem in this world. We can be the most conscientious, hardworking, striving to be the best example of Christianity there is, and every once in a while the world's going to jump up and grab us. And we're going to get a blemish. And we're going to have a spot and we're going to want to scratch it. I've learned long ago, don't scratch the poison ivy. <laughs> but every once in a while I do. Because it really starts to itch. And sometimes in the world in which we live, people, and I'm talking to myself as well as I am you, we get involved in things we shouldn't get involved in. And as much as we want to be children of God, as much as we want our lawn to be pretty and everything in it, the flowers are blooming and, and everything's going nice, every once in a while, even as we try as hard as we can, the world jumps up and grabs us because we're human. Satan knows what tempts us. Satan knows what will drag us away from Jesus. And we can have the best intentions ever and still give in to something we shouldn't give in to. And when we do that, we don't conduct ourselves worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not acting like a good citizen in God's kingdom should act like. The 
thanks be to God. His blood cleanses us of all sin. And now we've got some salve and stuff I can put on my poison ivy so it doesn't itch as much. But it doesn't just immediately go away. And sometimes when we get caught up in things that we shouldn't be caught up in or we let something rub up against us that we should never even be close enough to to rub up against us, it doesn't immediately go away. And when we do things to hurt other people, when we act in ways we shouldn't act, it isn't always easy just to say, I'm sorry, and it's all over. It doesn't work that way with most of us. The memories are there. The thought process is there. The anticipation that you're going to do it again is there. And we have a hard time sometimes letting Christ be seen in us because, doggone it, I want me to be seen in us. I want to have my two cents worth. I want to have my say-so. And God help me sometimes, I think, and I really don't care what God wants right now. I'm just going to do this because I want to. And so the poison ivy breaks out. And it's obvious to people around me, Bob, you shouldn't act that way. Bob, you shouldn't talk like that. Bob, that's not the way a preacher is supposed to be. Isn't it nice that you're not the preacher? <laughs> Nobody will ever look at you and say, hey, you're the preacher, you shouldn't do that. any bigger a stand to stand on than you do. In fact, I suspect more people see you through the week than who see me. I spend most of my time dealing with Central Christian Church, teaching Bible studies, studying with some of you one-on-one, -on -one, doing things, putting sermons together, all that kind of stuff. It takes up a lot of my time. Whereas you, many of you, are out in the world, some of you still working, see all kinds of people day in and day out, you will run across many more people who are watching you than I will. So don't ever sit around thinking, hey, Bob, you're the preacher, you better get your act together. You're a child of God. You need to get your act together. We need to live in a way that gives God is glory. Jesus prayed that prayer that most of us have said hundreds if not thousands of times in our lifetime. Our Father, Father's Day. You know God's our Father? Isn't that awesome? We have a Father. We can celebrate Father's Day every day of our life because of what he's done for us. But Jesus prayed, our Father who art in heaven. His model prayer for us. We need to recognize God is our Father. Hallowed be thy name. I love the old King James. You know, there are just some verses that should always be read in the old King James. 23rd Psalm is another one. You know, those, those passages that we learned by heart when we were little kids, and all of us either used the King James or maybe the American Standard, which had a lot of the King James language in it, and we learned so many of these verses in a way that they just don't sound right in modern English. But Jesus said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. And then the part that we pray and I suspect ignore. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus' prayer for us was, live on this life the way the angels in heaven obey do what God wants you to do the way the heavenly beings in heaven now do because God tells them to do it. You and I, when we pray that prayer, are asking God, let your will be done in my life the same way those beings in heaven do your will. And many times we don't do a very good job of that. But that should be our prayer. We want God's kingdom to live in us. We want God as king of my life to rule the way I live and to help me live the way I'm supposed to. Paul's already talked about in this chapter that we have a partnership in the gospel, a partnership with each other. In this church, we're to be working together. 
He says we're to be proclaiming the gospel as well. And then he says we're to conduct ourselves as citizens of the kingdom. And I don't know about you, but I look at our nation and I wonder what on earth is going on here. And I don't know why, but it seems like the last six or seven years is just snowballing. And uh, every time you turn around, there's some new perversion or some new abnormality or some new way of life that I'd never heard of before. Talk to some of our teachers, and I was, I was somewhere, I guess maybe my online Bible study, and somebody said, you know, this world has gotten so crazy that at a school one of my kids go to, there's a couple of kids that think they're animals. And they go along the school on their hands and knees, going, meow, woo, woo, meow, woo, woo. And, and the teachers have to let them be animals. And they have to, some of them, and if you talk to some of our members here, they'll tell you, that's not just up in New York City or California, that's right here in Johnson City. Right here in our school system, there are children coming to school every day believing they are cats. And I suppose they sit around licking them. So oh, I shouldn't do that. It's poison ivy. <laughs> <laughs> but they lick themselves. They have a litter box that they bring to school with them. Now, fortunately, at least here, apparently, the parent has to come clean the kitty cat litter box. I don't know about you, but just imagining that makes me think my kids go into a private school. You know, I don't know how this how it works, but parents are allowing their children to go to school believing they're somebody's pet. I don't know what's going on in this world today. You know, California's got a law passed into its state legislature that says. If parents don't identify with their child as the gender that child wants to be and treat them as though that child is the gender that child wants to be, it's child abuse and the state can take their children away from them. So if your child decides, I want to be a boy, although it's a girl, and you refuse to call him him or they, and buy him boys clothes and boys toys and boys whatever, the school can take your child away from you if that bill passes in California and those people out there, God help them, are crazy enough, I expect it to pass. Because the Democrats have a super majority in the California state legislature. Now I don't know about you, but I never thought I would live in a world where a parent couldn't make their child be the biological sex they were born with under threat of the state that they will take your children away from you. And I look at some of the people around this country and think, you're not a very good citizen of the United States of America. We should be better than that. We should know better than this. And yet we do the same thing in God's kingdom. You know, there are preachers who purport to be Christians who are saying it's okay for homosexuals to be homosexual and you can do whatever you want. That we as Christians just need to accept them into our fellowship and let them live the way they want to live and do the things they want to, marry the same sex if that's what they want to, and we need to stop telling them it's not right. I would not want to be that preacher standing before God someday. I don't get to decide who's saved and who isn't, and I try never to say who is and who isn't, but I can read my Bible where God says homosexuality is an abomination. And for someone who claims to be a child of God to preach that it isn't, I'm not sure what citizenship they belong to. Because they're going to have a hard time justifying what they teach to God one day. And what's even worse is those people they're teaching who will grow up believing it's okay in spite of what the Bible says. It isn't just a preacher. He's got enough problems. But he's dragging all these other people with them. And not only is that preacher dragging those people with them, they're turning the world against other Christians who want to use the Bible as a guide. Because now we're the babies. We're the homophobes. 
We're the people that don't let people live the way they want to. And please do not misunderstand me. God loves all of us. God sent Jesus to die for the person who's homosexual the same as he did the person who's straight. We need to love those people and teach them the truth. You do not love people by allowing them to continue to believe a lie. Any more you would if somebody said, I don't need to believe in Jesus. I'm a good person. I can get to heaven any way I want to. If we don't say something to them, you're allowing them to go to hell because they're not hearing the truth. And we need to speak the truth. We need to do it in love. We need to do it with gentleness. And we need to let people know we love you. And God loves you. Don't ever, ever, ever treat someone who's different from you poorly just because they're different from you. Don't ever go around casting bad language at people just because their sexual goal or purpose or lifestyle is different from yours. We need to teach the truth. But you need to do it in love. And you need to let people know God loves you no matter what you're doing the same way God loves us no matter what we're doing. Show of hands, how many of us are perfect in here? Not a one of us. How many of us in here does God love? All of us. And God loves me with all my imperfections with all the things I do that I know I shouldn't do, with all the things I intentionally do that I know I shouldn't do, God still loves me. And I've been taught better. I had a mom and dad went to church. We were in church every time the doors were open. I know what the book says. I don't have any excuse. Some of these other people in the world today who are deceived by false teaching don't know any better sometimes. They believe what their mind tells them and they're acting on the way they believe they are. And, and I can give them a pass to some extent because they've been taught things that were incorrect. Those of us who are children of God who should be studying this book, who know what it says, we don't have any excuse. So do not get on Facebook and say, Bob said we could bash homosexuals. I did not say that. You can't do that. Our goal is to love them into Jesus. And the same way you and I continue to struggle with sin and have things in our lives that shouldn't be here, so do they. But they can become children of God and God can work on them the same way he's working on but you know, if we're not careful, we start laying down these lines. Well, this sin, that's eh, not such bad sin. And you know what? Which one of those sins that are such bad sins? Which one? They're all bad. Well, yeah, but some are worse. The ones that I do aren't so bad. Right? I mean, it, seriously, think about it. The ones I do that I struggle with, they're not so bad. They're just like a, a little white lie. Your lies, they're black and evil. <laughs> Mine are just little white lies. The things I do, they're just little character flaws. I meant better. I didn't mean to do that. I was mistaken. Your sin, you did it on purpose. You did it to hurt somebody. You knew what you were doing. I even preached about it last week and you did it anyway. Your sin has no... Isn't that the way we act sometimes? I can criticize you for the exact same thing I do, but you do it, it's much worse than me doing it. What's wrong with us? We're not acting like good citizens in God's kingdom. Lisa.
you know, there was a group, what Lisa's talking about, I think they're called the Perpetual Sisters of something or yeah. another. And they showed up at the Los Angeles Dodgers Stadium and performed for the Los Angeles Dodgers sometime this past week. They dress up like Catholic nuns and do some of the most grotesque, nastiest things you can imagine. And so, of course, the Catholic Church picketed Dodger Stadium when they showed up because they thought, this is horrible. I don't want people dressing up like nuns and having fake sex on the ground or throwing blood on the cross of Jesus or, or doing some of these things those perpetual sisters do because they think it's wrong. The Catholic Church thinks it's wrong. Many Christian people think it's wrong. But we live in a world to where you can no longer say something's wrong because if you do, you're a bigot. You're the bad person. You can't share the truth anymore because somebody's going to eat you alive. Do you realize that less than 1% of 1% of people are drag queens? Think about that. 0.001, I think it is of the population of the United States dressed like drag queens. How many times a day do you hear that word and see it in the news and understand something's going on with drag queens? Billions of times, if I can exaggerate a lot. You can't open a newspaper without seeing the next drag queen show. Johnson City had one for Pride Month last week. And even though they're less than 1%, 1% of 1% of the people in the United States of America, they are pushing it in your face because they want you to believe it's okay. And they want you to believe, you who don't think it's right to do those kinds of things, to realize you people are just a bunch of ignoramuses and you don't know what's going on. You need to just keep your mouth shut. And they're going to push it, and they're going to push it, and they're going to push it. And that's why we're reading about all this stuff. It isn't because there's more and more and more of them. It's because they want you to believe that that's normal. And it's okay for two-year-olds to watch men dress like women read books to them. It's okay for people to do some of the, the perpetual sisters and the things they do mocking the Catholic Church. Can you imagine for a moment if good Christian people dressed up in drag and ran around bashing drag ideas, what the headlines of the paper would be? It'd be you terrible, nasty Christians making fun of these drag queens. But they can do it all day long, and it's the headline of, boy, wasn't that nice. Boy, the freedom those people have to not let this stereotype Christianity tell us. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says, the fragrance of Christ is the smell of life to those who believe, but it's the smell of death to those who don't. And you know why that is? Because those of us who accept Christ as our Savior have life. Those of us who accept Jesus Christ understand that we're living in the best possible realm, but those who don't, and many of them know what they're doing is wrong, but they don't want you to tell them it's wrong. They don't want to hear it, because to them it's condemnation. It's death. And again, church, we need to act lovingly. We need to treat people well. We need to welcome anyone to the message of Jesus Christ. And don't you ever, ever, ever say something like, well, that person's homosexual. They can't come to Jesus. That's the lie some churches want you to believe. Jesus said, whosoever will may come. The goal is, once you come to know Christ, is you try to live your life the way the Bible says we're supposed to live. But we all come imperfect. We all come with sin. We all come with a lifestyle that is as far away from Jesus as possible many times. And the goal is, once we come to know Jesus, to live the way he wants us to live.
to help others live the way he wants us to live, to be the kind of example God wants us to be, to work in a partnership, to help each other be the people God wants us to be. I've gone way too long. I'm not even close to being done. We need to be citizens of God's kingdom. We need to live the way God wants us to live. And we need to help others do the same thing. As lovingly and kindly and gently as we can. To share the message of Christ with every person who needs to hear it. And that's every person on this earth. Don't write some people off because they're different from you. Don't shut the door on them simply because you don't like the way they live. We need to open God's kingdom to anyone who will accept Jesus as their Savior. But then we can't just let us live that way. We've then got to try and help each other be the people God calls us all to be. Let's pray. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for being with us. Help us, God, I pray, to work on our own lives, to, to stop pointing fingers at others, but to realize, God, I've got enough in my own life that I need to, to let you fix. And then as we deal with other people who we struggle to get along with, that we realize Jesus died for them the same as he died for me. And he wants them in heaven the same way he wants me in heaven. So that we will, out of compassion, just draw people to you. God, help us, I pray, to let your light shine in us, to not let our prejudices, our anger, our frustration, our lack of grace to control the way we live, but instead, God, to let you control us. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name. And one of the criticisms that Jesus got regularly was he eats with sinners, publicans, those people we don't like. And Jesus says those are the ones who need you the most. And sometimes if we're not careful in our churches, we shut the door to them. We don't want them sitting in here with us. They give me the creeps. You know, I don't understand them, and so I don't even want to dialogue with them. God says, it's all those people's name. Let's be the church God wants us to be. Let's share his grace with others because that's what he calls us to be. Rob's going to be up here as we sing this invitation song. We always let people come share. Share the gospel, share the praise, share a prayer request, some story, whatever you want to share with us. We'll listen to anything. We will pray with you. We'll rejoice with you. We will spend as much time as we need to with you to help us draw together to be the family God wants us to be. Maybe you've got something you'd like to share. If so, come up and share that with Rob as we stand and sing.
turn to any online request. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for being so, so good and being such a good father, giving us that example for all of us, not just fathers, for all of us to follow. Lord, fill us with your compassion for people, no matter the circumstances. Lord, I lift up prayers for our mission of the month, which is the jail ministry, Lord. That is a place where you are definitely needed. We know that. We, we thank the ones who are going in there. Uh, we lift them up and strengthen them so that they are able to bring your word to those who need it. Lord, we ask for help in our search for a worship leader. Lord, prepare that person and, and make them known to us. Lord, Veronica comes forward. Uh, she has asked prayers for her friend Charlotte who is taking a test today um, that will help determine her employment. Lord, she asked, Charlotte's asked for wisdom, for calmness, and being, being able to bring things to her mind that she already knows. But Lord, help her through that test. Lord, Donnie asked prayers for Kim Meister. He's had back surgery, and he asked for a quick recovery to that. Lord, we know that that can take a long time, but Lord, we pray for your healing touch on him. Lord, uh, Shelly, Mandy Cotty asked for prayers for um, her daughters, Mandy, Kayla, and Stephanie, as they're traveling to Boston on a sister trip. Boston and New York City is the pray for uh, travel mercies for them and that they have a wonderful time and they're safe. Roz comes forward bringing praises and thanks for this church and the stability that it's brought her in her life. Lord, we thank you for that. It, it's, it's your presence through us that, that helps her, Lord. So we, we thank you so much for all the blessings you've given us. We ask that you would continue to bless us as we go throughout the week. Lord, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. In his name I pray. Amen. The blood of Jesus shed on the cross that allows our sins to be forgiven. And again, it doesn't matter what our sins are. You may think they're not as bad as somebody else's. You may think they're worse than everybody else's. But the blood of Jesus cleanses all of us if we'll allow it to. We sang a song yesterday. God is a good, good father. Who he is. It's who he is. Today being Father's Day should remind us of what a great heavenly Father all of us have who belong to Jesus Christ. And that heavenly Father loved us so much that he allowed his son to leave his home, to come down to this world with all of its corruption and evil and nastiness and where so many people would just reject him. And still he came. And still he hung on a cross. And as he was hanging there, he said, it is finished. Jesus had come to do the will of his father, which was to die on that cross. And he did. My prayer for each of us would be, we would have the same kind of commitment that Jesus had while he was praying in the garden when he said, Father, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That should be what we're striving for. And as we take communion this morning and take this little piece of bread and this little bit of juice, we need to be remembering the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. That's the purpose of this, to be reminded of what Jesus did. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for being the good father that you are. 
for allowing us the opportunity to be part of your inheritance, to be able to claim sonship and daughtership with you because you will adopt us through the blood of Jesus Christ. <coughs> Father, help us today especially to remember what a great, loving Father you are. So God, throughout the week, I would pray we would be reminded of that. And we would live in such a way to give you glory and let people see Christ living in us. God, as we take this bread and drink this juice, help our minds to focus on the sacrifice you made, but the sacrifice also that Jesus made as his body was broken and his blood was shed. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name. We'll partake together by coming down the center aisle, take the double cup with you, go out the outside aisle back to your seat, and then we'll all participate together. You may come forward. already said this communion service represents the death of Jesus and so as he was with his disciples the night before he died he took that bread and broke it and he gave some of his some of it to his disciples and said take and eat for this represents my body broken for you he took the cup he blessed it and he said this cup represents my blood broke for shed for you thanks for being with us today Shelly's got something she'd like to share with us and so Shelly I'll turn it over to you and the Lord has just told me to get up here and witness about this so here I am a few weeks ago, it might have been a couple months ago, I can't remember if it was John or Pastor Bob or even Brian that were preaching on forgiveness. And like does my wonderful husband, he knows how much I've been struggling with forgiving, particularly two people in my not too distant past for some really hard feelings and some things that have happened. And I swear to you, I just I'm having like nightmares about these things. So I began to say, I started, after that sermon, I started to really ask God to help me forgive these people because the Lord forgives me every time. Why can't I forgive these people? What is happening? I can't, I just didn't seem to. Right. And so this past week, two separate nights, first night I had a dream where this first person and I were friends. 
and she was helping me pick out something to wear to an event. And she was being so kind to me. The very next night, that other person and I, I was helping her through something that was going on in her life that I said, you know, you can get through this. You can get through this. And I ended up hugging this person. And I look at that as God gave that to me in my dreams to let me know that they're forgiven and I've forgiven them. And I can't tell you what a weight is off. I don't think about those people anymore is that they've hurt me. I think about them as my friends. And that is to God's honest truth that I, I believe that, that through that training, God allowed me and through me also to get the victory. And so ask God to help you and to heal us. You know, it takes a lot to do that. To admit that we don't do everything right. And there are so many times we let issues in this world distract us from being the people God wants us to be. It doesn't matter what these people have done. It doesn't matter how long ago it was. Some of us carry grudges for decades. All of us, I suspect, know people in families who don't talk to their siblings. Don't talk to somebody in the family because something happened and they just can't forgive. Now that's not always possible to reconcile because it takes two. But they've got to want to work with you as well. But my prayer would be, as Shelley has said, don't let the burden be on you. If you need to forgive somebody, ask God to help you to learn to forgive somebody. It may not come overnight. It may take you a while. It may take a long time. But if you really want to be the people God wants you to be, his spirit will work on your heart. And ultimately, you'll be able to say, as Shelley did here, I know God's work in my life, and I can forgive those people. And I have forgiven those people. And all of us who have ever carried grudges know the burden's on you. Those people aren't even thinking about you anymore most of the time. They're moving on with their life. And you're sitting here carrying a load that you just can't lay aside. Let God help us to do that. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you. And I'll bring Lisa and Shelley for the service going so long. <laughs> I'm going to do one more thing if you'll let me. I'm going to finish my sermon real quick. Here's the last slide that would have played if we'd gone through the service. It says, so what does it mean to be a true and worthy citizen of the gospel? It doesn't mean you need to be perfect. Aren't we glad that's true? It doesn't mean you need to never offend, though we should try not to. Or always say the right thing at the right time, though we should try to do that too. Or never overlook anyone, though it would be nice to always get that right, too. It doesn't mean you need to meet everyone's expectations, or never have a bad day, and have no regrets, or have skills or culture values. It doesn't mean you need to be a Christian superhero. But a true and worthy citizen of the gospel stands firmly united by the Holy Spirit with other Christians while persevering and even suffering for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we're going to be citizens of God's kingdom, we've got to ask God to help us be the best citizens we can be. And he will. Thanks for being here today. Thank you for loving the Lord the way you do. And our prayer should be we can all love him more and help each other do that. Let's pray. Father God, thank you.
Thank you for loving us. Thank you for caring for us. Thank you for letting Jesus die for us. Thank you for letting us be your children. And God, as we close this service today, my prayer would be that all of us would leave this building committing to you that we'll be better citizens, that we will reflect your love and your laws in our lives. And not only would we reflect them in our lives, but God, we would share them with others. Even others, Father, who we might disagree with about lifestyle, about opinions, even about their politics. Knowing, Father, that this world is not our home and that you love every person here and every person on the face of the earth. God, help us to love them too. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed. Have a great week. Praise the Lord. I'm, somebody got something? Yes, praise God, Carol. Praise God.